Get your authorized version of the scriptures and turn in your authorized version of the scriptures to Isaiah chapter 29. Isaiah chapter 29. We are going to read from verses 13 on to verse 17 in Isaiah chapter 29. Follow me along. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are done in the dark. And they say, Who seeth us, and who knoweth us? Surely your turning of things upside down shall be as shall be esteemed as the potter's clay meaning it will be broken quite easily for shall the work say of him that made it he made me not or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it he hath no understanding Is it not yet a very little while, and Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest? Wherefore the Lord said, verse 13, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but they have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. This is a copy of the extreme oath of the Jesuit. Now, I have a video that I've done uh, a couple years ago, I think, where I was reading this from my uh, cell phone at the time. But I want to read some of this for you today because we're going to be addressing a little bit of the Jesuits today. Um, I'm going to be reading from this, okay, some portions from the Jesuit oath. Also going to be showing you some very interesting things out of this book. Okay, by Jacopo Leone, The Jesuit Conspiracy, The Secret Plan of the Order. Here's what the book looks like. I do recommend that you, uh, if you can, go ahead and get this book. Okay, we're going to look at some very shocking, interesting things. And also, too, we are going to look at the uh, something here in <laughs> the Canons and Decrees of the Council of Trent. <laughs> <laughs> okay and also of course we are going to be looking at several verses in scripture today okay we'll be looking at several verses of scripture today now uh, I do have a link for this on my channel okay so go ahead to the about section. You'll see the, uh, what, what, what is this? Uh, Biblebelievers.org, if it's still available. I hope it is. But uh, if not, you can find a copy of the uh, Extreme Oath of the Jesuits still to this day in its entirety. Okay? But you can get this off my channel. Okay? All right? So, going to be reading... Um, Quite a bit of this to you, all right? Here's part of the uh, Jesuit Extreme Oath, 
Okay? Like I said, you can download this off of my channel. Go ahead and check it out. My son, heretofore you have been taught to act the dissembler among Roman Catholics to be a Roman Catholic and to be a spy even among your own brethren, to believe no man, to trust no man, among the Reformers to be a Reformer, among the Huguenots to be a Huguenot, among the Calvinists to be a Calvinist, among the Protestants generally to be a Protestant. And very interesting, it says here, to believe no man, to trust no man, and to be a spy even among your own brethren. Oh, saying kind of like you have no favorites and that you're nobody's friend. The Jesuits are very brazen because they know they have a good idea that their plans may are going to succeed because the Church of the Living God the uh, redemption of the purchase possession, the catching away is going to be happening sometime here, <laughs> sometime here, when we do not know, but it's getting closer day by day. And these Jesuits and their coadjutors, a coadjutor is one uh, who works for the Jesuits who doesn't wear the Jesuit dog collar, okay? And there are many coadjutors out there today, many <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> there are many of them out there. Okay? But let's continue. And obtaining their confidence to seek even to preach from their pulpits and to denounce with all vehemence in your nature our holy religion and, and the Pope. See, Jesuits will talk about their own, you know, talk against it. They will. Yes. And even to descend so low as to become a Jew among Jews, that you might be enabled to gather together all information for the benefit of your order as a faithful soldier of the Pope. See, the Jesuit coadjutor, who doesn't wear the, the dog collar, who isn't openly a Jesuit, tries to sneak in. And what are they doing? They seek to gain information. They seek to gain information. Okay? That's what their goal is. That is their modus operandi. Why are they seeking information? I'm going to be quoting to you something from this book. Got to find it very quick. Okay? Uh, got to find it. Got to find it. Okay? where they want to obtain information. One second, got to pause this. Sorry about that, I had to find this. This is on page 149 of the Secret Plans of the Jesuits. Okay? Here is what I'm going to be reading you. Okay? Can you see that? Right here. Go ahead and pause that and read it. Okay? Now, here, this part of the Jesuit extreme oath, that you might be an enabler to gather together all information for the benefit of your order as a faithful soldier of the Pope. All right. As to our manner of proceeding with Protestants of all sorts, it must be, it must necessarily be verified, or it must necessarily be very varied excuse me my advice is this that we should keep a register of the most obstinate and dangerous amongst them and chiefly of their ministers this register in which their individual character should be noted would serve to warn our missionaries of the rocks and quicksands in their course that would know beforehand, they would know beforehand with whom they had to do, whom to avoid, and whom to venture upon according to the measure or the particular nature of their respective talents. This would be of admirable use in sparing 
us many defeats and unfortunate mistakes. That's what I read to you. Go ahead and pause that and read it. Right here. That's what I read to you, okay? What does that mean? These guys come in to you, want to come into your circles and get information of you. They seek to dig so they can have things to hold against you. That's their goal. And also in this book, which we're not going to look at this part of it today, um, the Jesuits keep records, registers of Protestant ministers, as they call us. As they call us. I'm not a Protestant. <laughs> I'm not a Protestant. Okay. But even Alberto Rivera gave credence that in Rome, they have these computers with all this information about many people. They're gathering information about you. And think about that stuff that you do online. Huh? They're gathering information on you. Hmm? That's what Jesuits do. So they know how to effectively attack. Like it says in the Book of Art of War, which I now believe is uh, actually written by the Jesuits and yet uh, attributed onto Sun Tzu. Know your enemy and yourself, victory in every battle. Isn't that right? You pond scum. Let's continue with this. Uh, uh, of the Jesuit extreme oath. You have been taught to insidiously plant the seeds of jealousy and hatred between communities, provinces, states that were at peace, and incite them to deeds of blood, involving them in war with each other, and to create revolutions and civil wars in countries that were independent and prosperous. Cultivating the arts and the sciences and enjoying the blessings of peace to take sides with the combatants and to act secretly with your brother Jesuit who might be engaged on the other side. The Hegelian principle on both sides working to the same end to affect the outcome. Who gave Hegel this information? Who taught Hegel? How did Hegel come about this? I wonder. But openly opposed to that which you might be connected, only that the church might be the gainer in the end. In the conditions fixed in the treaties for peace, and that the end justifies the means. You have been taught your duty as a spy. to gather all statistics, facts, and information in your power from every source. Oh, like uh, spending uh, countless hours online doing research about certain individuals. Hmm? Hounding certain individuals. You shall know them by their fruits. <laughs> Pond scum. <laughs> Pond scum Jesuit. <laughs> to ingratiate yourself into the confidence of the family circle of Protestants and heretics of every class and character, as well as that of the merchant, the banker, the lawyer among the schools and universities and parliaments and legislatures and the judiciaries and councils of state, and to be all things to all men, for the Pope's sake, whose servants we are unto death. You have received all your instructions heretofore as a novice, a neophyte, and have served as coadjutor, 
confessor and priest, but you have not yet been invested with all that is necessary to command in the army of Loyola in the service of the Pope. You must serve the proper time as the instrument and executioner as directed by your superiors. The provincial, one of their provincials. And you know who that is? I have a few guesses. <laughs> Pond scum. For none can command here who has not consecrated his labors with the blood of heretics. <laughs> oh, yeah. Kind of like putting your foot on the gas pedal and swinging for the fences, huh? <laughs> for without the shedding of blood... No man can be saved. Ah, the shedding of blood. Ooh. We're going to look into that aspect within the scriptures here in a little bit. Therefore, it to fit yourself for your work and make your own salvation sure, you will, in addition to your former oath of obedience, to your order and allegiance to the Pope, repeat after me. Now, here is the actual, here's part of the extreme oath. Quote, I, Guess who? Now in the presence of Almighty God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Blessed Michael the Archangel, the Blessed Saint John the Baptist, the Holy Apostles Saint Peter and Saint Paul, and all the saints and sacred hosts of heaven, and to you, my ghostly father, the Superior General of the Society of Jesus, who is, uh, what's that guy's name? Um, Sosa, today. Sosa. Yeah. Sosa, the Black Pope, the head of the Jesuit order, the most powerful man on the face of the earth today. The most powerful man on earth today is Sosa. Founded by St. Ignatius Loyola in the pontificate of Paul III and continued to the present, do by the womb of the Virgin, the matrix of God, and the rod of Jesus Christ, declare and swear that His Holiness the Pope is Christ's vice regent and is the true and only head of the Catholic or universal church throughout the earth, and that by virtue of the keys of binding and loosing <laughs> given to His Holiness by my Savior Jesus Christ, He hath power to dispose heretical kings, princes, states, commonwealths, and governments, all being illegal without his sacred confirmation, that they may safely be destroyed. Therefore, to the utmost of my power, I shall and will defend this doctrine of his holiness, right, and custom against all usurpers of the heretical or Protestant authority whatever, especially the Lutheran of Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and the now pretended authority and churches of England and Scotland, and branches of the same now established in Ireland and on the continent of America and elsewhere, and all adherents in regard that they be usurped and, her and heretical, opposing the sacred mother church of Rome. I do now renounce and disown any allegiance as due to any heretical king, prince, or state named Protestants or liberals, or obedience to any of the laws, magistrates, or officers. Yes, um, the Jesuit is loyal unto their superior. 
And the Catholic is loyal unto the Pope. See, a Catholic puts the Pope and the Vatican first over the nation in which they live. Okay? They are loyal unto the Pope. As the Jesuit is loyal unto the Black Pope. Okay? They have no allegiance except unto their superiors. It's what makes these men very, very dangerous. Very dangerous. Okay? Let's continue. I do further declare that the doctrine of the churches of England and Scotland, of the Calvinists, Huguenots, and others of the name Protestants or liberals to be damnable, and they themselves damned, who will not forsake the same. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, according to the, uh, the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent, which is their go-to, okay? Vatican II also um, implemented, and the Jesuits had a lot to do with that. They're all supposed to adhere, adhere to the councils and decrees, the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent. Okay? So, according to the Council of Trent, I'm an anathema. Oh, boy! <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, okay. I do further declare that I will help assist and advise all or any of his holiness agents in any place wherever I shall be in Switzerland, Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, England, Ireland, or America, or in any other kingdom or territory I shall come to and do my uttermost to extirpate the heretical Protestants or liberals doctrines and to destroy all their pretended powers legal or otherwise. I do further promise and declare that notwithstanding I am dispensed with to assume my religion heretical for the propaganda of the mother church's interest to keep secret and private all her agents counsels from time to time as they may entrust me and not to divulge directly or indirectly by word, writing or circumstance, whatever but to execute all that shall be, uh, shall be proposed, given in charge or discovered unto me by you, my ghostly father, or any of this sacred covenant. I do further promise and declare that I will have no opinion or will of my own. Yeah, they're like, uh, they're a mindless sword in the hand of their provincial, okay? Their lifeless body. Okay? Or any mental reservation whatsoever, even as a corpse or cadaver. Perndi ac cadaver. And this is also taken from the spiritual exercise of Ignatius de Loyola. Okay? Which is the blueprint for modern mind control but will unhesitatingly obey each and every command that I may receive from my superior in the militia of the Pope and of Jesus Christ. Like Eric John Phelps said, there is no such thing as a disobedient Jesuit. And those who do, who get outed or leave the order, eventually the order does catch up to them. Case in point, Alberto Rivera, who had a tooth problem and went to a dentist, and that was the Jesuits' opportunity, and they poisoned him through that dentist. They got him eventually. They did. It's only a matter of time if anyone leaves the Jesuit order that their time on earth will be coming to an end. I'm sure Alberto Rivera knew that. And I'm sure any one of you uh, coadjutors, you Jesuit scumbags out there, I know you know that as well. Because you're more afraid of them than you are of the Lord. You would rather cross the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, 
then cross your God, Sosa, the black pope, the superior general of the Jesuits. That I may go to any part of the world whithersoever I may be sent, to the frozen regions of the north, the burning sands of the desert of Africa, or the jungles of India, to the centers of civilization of Europe, or to the wild haunts of the barbarous savages of America, without murmuring or repining, and will be submissive in all things whatsoever communicated to me. Right here. I furthermore promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war. Never mind what it says in Titus, because the scriptures, and we're, we're going to look at that, the scriptures do not apply to these people. And wage relentless war, secretly or openly. Oh, by having 30 channels and changing the names of the channels so people can't find them or trace them because her ways are always movable that thou canst not know them. <laughs> Against all heretics, Protestants and liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, Yes, brethren, a Jesuit, if given the opportunity, would kill you. They would, when given the opportunity. You got to remember, these men are patient. These men are very patient. Okay? And their job is to wage relentless war. Okay? because they're a military order. That's why a lot of their tactics you can find within the art of war, uh, supposedly by Sun Tzu, okay? These are very patient men. And whenever they have the opportunity to do any damage or maybe even kill you, they're gonna pounce on it. Be aware of that. Be aware of that. And that I will spare neither age Sex or condition doesn't matter to them. They kill their own mother. They kill their own father. They will go down on a sinking ship. I'm talking about the Titanic, if you don't know. Okay? Yeah. Because for the greater glory of God, ad majorium the glorium, that's their motto. The end justifies the means for the greater glory of God. These men, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta give them proper respect in that due. These men will die for the devil because they don't care about anything but the glory of their father, the devil. And there are those of you who don't take this seriously. Well, oh boy. And that I will hang, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous, infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women, and crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate forever their execrable race. That when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poison cup. Oh, the poison. Poison this is very big with the Jesuit order. Uh, remember that the coronavirus, okay? Poison crown, okay? Yeah, yeah. There's a Jesuit tie in there, definitely. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The strangulating cord. The steel of the poniard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, 
as I at any time may be directed so to do by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith of the Society of Jesus. And in confirmation of which I hereby dedicate my life, my soul, and all my corporal powers, and with this dagger which I now receive, I will subscribe my name written in my own blood, in testimony thereof, and should I prove false or weaken in my determination, may my brethren and fellow soldiers of the militia of the Pope cut off my hands and my feet. See, they're afraid of men. And this is omerta, which is very similar to the mafia vow that they take. Very similar. Very similar. Omerta or comerta, or whatever it is, okay? Very similar. This, this, this is where the mafia, the Italian mafia, this is where they get their stuff. And my throat from ear to ear, may ear to ear, my belly open and sulfur burn therein with all the punishment that can be inflicted upon me on earth and my soul be tortured by demons in an eternal hell forever. Now, do you, with hearing that, brethren, can you start to understand a little bit the determination and the never-ending relentless drive that these pond scum Jesuits have? Hmm? Can you, can, can you kind of grasp it? They don't fear God. They fear men. And the fear of man bringeth a snare, doesn't it? Oh, and you men are snared, aren't you? All of which I, say your name, I double dog dare you. Do swear by the blessed Trinity <laughs> and blessed sacraments, which I am now to receive, to perform and on my part to keep inviolable, and do call all the heavenly and glorious hosts of heaven to witness the blessed sacrament of the Eucharist, and witness the same further with my name written and with the point of this dagger dipped in my own blood and sealed in the face of this holy covenant. And then it goes on to say about what the superior says unto him. <clears throat> so, but that's, that's pretty much the Jesuit extreme oath. And note, remember the relentless war, okay? Okay, remember that? Here now on page 156 and 157. I'm going to read a little bit more about what we just heard about in the uh, Extreme Oath, about that relentless war. Okay, I'm going to be starting right here where my finger is. Okay, and I'm going to be reading where my finger is right there. Okay, so here. Okay, I'm going to read that right there, pause it and read it, and I'm going to read this to where my finger is, right here, okay? So go ahead and pause that and read it if you want to. Did you get that? Okay. Page 156 and 157, Secret Plan of the Jesuits. Let us meanwhile carefully avoid entering into an open and serious strife with the Protestants. We could not but lose ground by it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And we're going to see on that a little bit later. But we're going to be getting to some scriptures about a certain topic. And it would call too much attention to the subject. People who are greedy of novelty would be enchanted to see such a combat open. And, and blah, 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 amen, look at here on YouTube. People want to see that. 
They want to see the combatants of Protestantism and, and Jesuitism going at it. They want to see that. Because especially here in my nation, America, America is basically ancient Rome. It's the mob. Conjure magic for us and we'll be distracted. Take away our freedoms. And instill our entertainment. The Jesuits will give America death. And we will love them for it. Ain't that right? Yeah. Let us prefer a secret war, which, though less brilliant, is more sure to bring us the advantage. Let us shun too much light. Let us, contend, let us content ourselves with pulling down the stones of the Protestant cathedral, one by one, instead of venturing to carry it by storm. This would be neither prudent nor useful. Let us pour contempt upon the inglorious, naked, cadaverous religion. And let us exalt the antiquity, the harmonies, and the wonderful perfectibility of our own. <laughs> and this, you're going to like this. But we must, above all things, be provi provided with a store of arguments to parry the objections which the Protestants are so prone to bring forward, and which are founded on the vices and crimes of the ancient clergy and popes, the Dark Ages. But ah, 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 check this out. A difficult theme, I admit, and one which merits a special theory. For after all, what have we to allege sufficiently a dart it, a dart it, subtle and cogent to enable us to retire with honor from these discussions with which we are so often per pestered. <laughs> with which we are so often pestered. Since in ah, it's interesting that a coadjutor often refers to me as a pest. <laughs> you look in the mirror there, Jack? I know you can't because if you did, the mirror would break on you. I get that. I get that. I, get, I understand. I understand. <laughs> if we could but meet them armed with some good replies, the question might at least be maintained in suspense. You well know that the ground upon which the Protestants are most harassing is the Middle Ages, which they are pleased to call the Dark Ages. <laughs> Unfortunate, and listen to this. Listen to this. This is from the mouth of a Jesuit. Unfortunately, on this subject, our best writers do but too often furnish our adversaries with arms against us. <laughs> yeah, true history cannot be denied. Even these repugnant Jesuits know this. But now I'm going to read this part. We're going to look at this again. This is going to be quite, this is going to be a long video. I hope you're prepared for this. Okay. But I'm going to look in this again, but I want to read this one more, uh, one more part to, the, uh, to you about this. Then we're going to get to some scripture. Okay. And this is on page 158. This orange part right here. Okay. Can you see that? Okay. Go ahead, pause that, and read it. Did you get that? We have, however, one source of rejoicing. We cherish at the bottom of our hearts this principle, that whatever does not unite with us must be annihilated. And we hold ourselves ready to make as soon as we shall have the means, an energetic application of this principle. Whenever they have the chance, they're going to kill you. Whenever they see a chance, they're going to take it. Whether it is an attack, a slander, an attempted murder attempt, 
whatever it may be, they're going to take it. See, they're very fastidious about that. Always looking. Remember, we're being watched, brother, sister. That's why we have to trust entirely on our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. That's why we got to walk uprightly according to the scriptures. Because isn't it interesting enough to note that these coadjutors, these Jesuits, these pond scum, they're going to be the first to find it and pounce on it. And these people know no mercy. The wounds of a friend are faithful, but the kisses of an enemy are deceit. I just paraphrased that, beg your pardon. Protestantism, on the contrary, completely disarmed itself when it when first it preached the doctrine, li, li, listen to this, the doctrine of toleration. They're even admitting it. The minute they, they, they're even admitting it. Look here in America, which was part of the Jesuit plans themselves, to allow toleration. Ecumenical. And there's, there's a whole part in this about the ecumenical thing, which we're not going to look at. Okay? But even they said, you, you done messed up. You said toleration. You gave us a door. In that respect, then, brethren, knowing what these Jesuits are about, knowing what their purpose is, the counter-reformation, you, you, you heard of their oath. And that's still, to my knowledge, is still on the congressional records of the United States of America. With, you know, President Harris and, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> with a uh, smoking Joe at the helm, they might have expunged it by now. Okay, but you can still find it. Okay, you can still find it. Okay. If they have a door, they're going to take it. If they have that much, they're going to take it. You have to know that of them. That's what they are there to do. So you need to be on your guard, Church of the Living God. And you really got to take care of with whom you speak to. You really do. Time tells everything. Like I often tell you, over time, these coadjutors, these devils, will expose themselves. They'll shoot themselves in the foot. It happens every time. And there are subtleties that you can pick out. For example, if you meet someone and in a month they're picking at you, trying to dig very intimate secrets of your past life from you, uh, that's a little... That's a little... Over time, true friends, true brethren, I shoot to you. Keep that in mind. But you gotta, you gotta, <laughs> even they. Pro Protestantism, on the contrary, completely disarmed itself when it, when first it preached the doctrine of toleration and declared that to persecute for the sake of religion is a violation of the gospel. Oh yes, this is well for those who are satisfied with small things, but not for us who aim at greatness, which shall eclipse and annul all of their greatness. And what do they uh, seek? The empire of the world. To rule the world by the volition of a single man. Quoting a Napoleon Bonaparte. And who is that single man? The black pope, Sosa, but ultimately the son of perdition. See, it's all about flesh. It's all about flesh to the Catholic, to the Jesuit. It's all about the flesh. 
It's all flesh to them. Their religion is a religion of flesh. And their spirit is the spirit of Antichrist. Okay? That's why they harp on things of the flesh. The flesh, you know? The skin suit? Openly promoting Catholicism by harping on such a thing. Oh, you know? By holding that a mere confession, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, proves, right? They, these guys like to think that, well, I can say that, that proves I'm of the church of the living God. <laughs> no, it doesn't. The context of that is for those who are preaching. Okay? Okay? I'm not going to get into that. I've already covered that. Okay? But see, it's all about the flesh to these people. Why is that? Because their God is a little round cookie. The Eucharist. But now on that, on that, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the flesh of Jesus. No. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The blood. And see, these philosophical Jesuit coadjutors what does the scripture say about philosophy? Should we, should we go there? Should we go there? Yeah, let's go there. What does the scripture say about philosophy? Which the, the Jesuits are really into philosophy. Over there in one of my uh, many books on the Jesuit order, they got a whole book on that. The, 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 hold, hold on, I'll show you. I'll show you. Okay, let me show you this. Ten Universal Principles, a brief philosophy of the life issues. Remember, Jesuits, uh, all their big guys are called moral theologians, okay? And this is by Spitzer, F. Robert J. <laughs> Spitzer, S.J., Society of Jesus. Okay, can you see that? Huh? Oh, oh, there you go, see that? See that? Yeah, philosophy from the Jesuits, okay? And philosophy is what? The wisdom of men, is it not? Go to Colossians, book of Colossians. You ought to know where this is at. <clears throat> Colossians chapter two, verse eight. What does the scripture say about philosophy? Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. You know, it dawned upon me recently, you know, this whole thing about the flesh. It's Catholic, harping onto this thing of the flesh. It's Catholic. It's nothing but Catholic. But see, these coadjutors will philosophize. Well, if Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh, there would be no blood. So, see how they do it? But what say the scriptures? The scriptures. What said the scriptures about that? Shall we look? Go to, Gen get your authorized version of the scriptures. Go to Genesis. Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. We will be reading verses 4 on to verse 6 in Genesis chapter 9. 
Genesis chapter 9, verses 4 on to verse 6. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. And also in the book of Acts, it talks about you shall eat neither things strangled nor blood. Okay? You're not supposed to eat blood. Okay? <laughs> in uh, three dispensations. Okay? For the law, under the law, and after the law, this dispensation today. Um, drinking of blood, cannibalism, that kind of stuff, you know, is, for, is prohibited within the scripture. Okay? In three dispensations. Okay? One after another. All right? Let's continue. And surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast. Will I require it? And at the hand of man. At the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth, sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. Image of God. Spirit, soul, and body. Okay? Spirit, soul, and body. The body. You know, the skin suit. The body. Okay? You get that? Now go to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Openly adhering and defending Catholic doctrine. Right under our noses. A lot of these people are doing that, brethren. A lot of these people are doing that. You have to be aware of that. Okay? Exodus chapter 12, verses 3 under verse 13. Come on. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying... In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their father, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto him, next unto his house, take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep, or from the goats. And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. Now stop right at verse 7. On the side posts and on the upper They'll strike the blood. Okay? What does that symbolize? It's a cross. Think about it. On the top and on the sides. All right? Now, that was a symbol. Obviously, they did that literally, yes. But a picture of the, of the cross. Okay? Now, they were not looking forward to the cross. Okay? Back here. Okay? That's nonsense. I, 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 several videos I've mentioned and blown that, you know, out of the water. That's not true, okay? They were not looking forward to the cross back here. Uh, when you look at it, we have the benefit of today looking at that, okay? Verse 7, And they shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post, of the houses wherein they shall eat. It's right there. Okay. Were they looking forward to the cross? No, they were not. Okay. It wasn't revealed until many, 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 many. I, what is it? Years and years and years and years and years and years and years after this. Okay. Okay. It was a mystery. All right. But the way of the cross was ordained from the beginning. Yes, it was. It wasn't revealed unto man until much later, after his death, burial, and resurrection. Okay? That's easily to be proved. All you got to do basically is read Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Okay? Okay? And look at Pope Peter. <clears throat> Excuse me. Peter. 
who said, uh, this shouldn't be, no, Lord, you're not going to do this. If they were looking forward to the cross all the way back then. They would have known that. And it's like, praise you, Lord, this has to be done this way. I'm sorry it is, but this is, you know, they should have known, but they didn't. Because the Lord didn't reveal it unto them. Okay? And you see it right there. And what does it mention? The blood. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread. And with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire. His head with his legs with the protuberance thereof. Pertinence thereof. Big apart. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods, little g, of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the flesh shall be to you for it, <clears throat> excuse me, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. The blood. And see, right, right there now, the, these coadjutors, well, you couldn't have blood without flesh. That's a Catholic argument. That's a Catholic argument. If flesh was so salvific, pertinent to our salvation, wouldn't you think he would have mentioned something of it? His body was broken for us. Okay? His body did not see corruption, meaning it didn't decay. But his visage was so marred above that of any man. Torn, stabbed, cut, bruised. Probably gangrenous. Okay? And what came out of that? Blood. And go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Okay? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Okay, you know when it said in uh, verse 13 in Exodus chapter 12 about when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. He died for us. For us sinners who are chief. For anyone who will come to him on his terms. Broken and contrite. Now go to Leviticus. Here, here's the. Here's. Here's. Uh, here's the thing. Leviticus chapter 17. Okay. And this. The Jehos. Even would do something with. The, you know. No. Uh, what was it? transfusions or whatever, which they, of course, change because her ways are always movable that thou canst not know them. Okay? Leviticus chapter 17, verses 10 and 11. Leviticus chapter 17, verses 10 and 11. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and I will cut him off from among his people. Uh, there, there it is again, not eating blood. And you look in the book of Acts, chapter 15. And 
three dispensations for the law, under the law, and after the law. Okay? Boop! Nonsense. Your, your little Eucharist that you're defending, <laughs> your little perfectly round, sun shaped cookie, uh, bail cookie that you're defending, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to look up more into that a little later. Okay, but let's continue. Verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. So your flesh wouldn't be able to sustain anything if there were no blood in it. <laughs> so then, what? So then what? The flesh needs the blood. And what washes away our sins? Verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the pucarist. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. Now, go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 26. Now, all you need to do, really, is read Isaiah chapter 52 and Isaiah chapter 53. By his stripes we were healed. He will sprinkle many. His visage was so scar was so marred. Okay? Okay? The Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, came here to die. Okay? And it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. The blood of God. God, who was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Yes. 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 But does his actual physical flesh wash away our sins? Or is it the blood? And see, there again, the Jesuit will say, you can't have blood without the flesh. Really. But what say the scriptures? Tough guy. What say the scriptures? Let's continue. Go to Matthew. Go to Matthew chapter 26. Okay? Matthew chapter 26. One verse. Matthew chapter 26. Uh, let's read verses 26 on to verse 28. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed, and blessed it, and break it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave, to, gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And again, the, the argument that uh, Brother Brian brought up the one time, it's like, if, you know, if this is the institution of the Pucharist, how come, using Brother Brian's argument, how come he didn't put up his arm and it's like, okay, everybody, come on, take a good bite out of this. Uh, the Lord's Supper here. Is symbolic, not literal. Okay? But what is it? What's what saith the scripture? This is for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. It's the blood. Yes? God was manifest in the flesh. Yes. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. He is alive. Yes. Yes. 
Yes. Amen. But what washes away our sins? Hmm? It's not that you count his flesh as a trivial thing. No, 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 no. But when you elevate that over. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Oh, that sounds Catholic to me, buddy. Exalting the flesh over what washes away our sins. That sounds Catholic to me. Yeah. Yeah. Now, let's, let's go to Romans, okay? Let's go to Romans, chapter 3. Don't worry, we're going to look at John chapter 6 here in a bit. Don't worry about that, okay? John, uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 25. Uh, let's read verse 24 and verse 25, okay? Romans chapter 3. And you got to read chapters 1 and 2 and Romans chapter 3 up to about 18 to understand the context from verses 19 to the close of the chapter, okay? That's what these easy believism heretics do. They like to exclude all this other stuff and focus on right this, okay? We're looking at this to prove a point. That's all, Okay? What are we proving? Verse 24 and 25. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Okay? And we're going to look at 1 John here in a little bit. But it's the blood. It's the blood, not the flesh. Okay? Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Much more than being now justified by his flesh, we shall be... No, excuse me, what does it say? Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And see, again, they're saying, well, you can't have blood without the flesh. Yes, you're right. Bravo. Bravo. But what's, what does that say? What does that say? Huh? What does that say? Much more than being now justified by his blood. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. His blood. Yeah, okay, yeah, bravo. Very good, you says what? Pond scum. Yes. He was provided a body. He will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Yes, a body, the flesh. Yes, you know, the flesh, the skin suit, uh, okay, that was beaten, torn, bruised, gangrenous, bloody, hair ripped out of it. Yeah, yeah, yes, you're right. But what say the scripture? What saith the scripture? It's the blood. You wretched Catholic. You wretched Jesuit. With your veiled Catholicism. Excuse me. With your veiled Jesuitism. Yeah. Yeah. We'll take a long walk off a short pier, buddy. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye 
who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And see, to you enter and to intuit into that, well, you can't have blood without the flesh. I, 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 <laughs> what said the scripture there, buddy? What said the scripture? Hmm? Yes. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Yes. God was manifest in the flesh. Yes. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. What about Colossians chapter 1? Hmm? Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Okay? And what about Colossians chapter, 20, uh, chapter 1, verse 20? And having made peace through the blood of his cross by himself to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. But right here, let's, okay. Let's go to 1 John. We were going to look at 1 uh, Pete, but we're not going to do that. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. Okay? But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. The blood. The blood. Can't have blood without flesh. Bravo. But what does that say? It doesn't say, and the blood and flesh of Jesus Christ. No. The blood is the life of the flesh. The blood is the life of the flesh. And the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son, cleanseth us from all sin. You're defending Catholicism. You're veiled Catholicism. And who's the one really speaking blasphemy? In your veiled little way, because your ways are always movable. You're defending Catholicism. Yeah. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. Oh, and, and let's look at one more. One more. Okay. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. Okay. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto whom, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. If we were to make a big ado about the flesh of Jesus Christ, Okay, as far as it being something pertinent to being our salvation, he would have put it there, but he it's constantly the blood, it's constantly the blood, and yes, again, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, God was manifest in the flesh, yes, yes, bloodied. Torn, ripped, punctured, 
lacerated, gangrenous flesh that produced blood that cleanseth us from all sin. Now, what about the flesh? Go to John chapter uh, 3. John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Let's read verses 5 on to verse 8. Here's another big one for the Catholics. John chapter 3, verses 5 on to verse 8. Our Lord speaking unto Nicodemus. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And in the decrees and counsels of Trent, okay, they condemn as anathema those who say that this is talking about natural and then spiritual. Okay? Natural and spiritual. Okay? That's what this is talking about. They condemn the scriptural teaching of that as anathema. They do. And baptism, because unto the Catholic, you need to be baptized in order to be saved. And they just throw water on you. There are apparently some Catholics that do dunk you. But Catholic, you got to be baptized. And it's strange that the Pentecatholics say you got to be baptized in accordance with Acts 2.38. <laughs> yeah. That which is born of the flesh. Oh, excuse me. Verse 5 again. And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Okay, note water and spirit, okay? Let's have our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, uh, explain this, okay? That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Natural. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Okay, uh, verse 6, by the way, but he just expounded what verse 5 means. Okay? Natural than spiritual. Okay? Comprende? Verse 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, singular, ye, plural, must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, and canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Okay? That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Natural. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verses 12 under verse 16. Now we have received not the, not the spirit of the world but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, lives within us. Okay? And the Lord is that Spirit, the Holy Ghost, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And these Jesuits, they have the spirit of their father, the devil. They have the Antichrist spirit. Okay? But the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And let's go to Romans chapter 8. 
Romans chapter 8, verses 1 under verse 4. Okay, then, then we'll get to John chapter 6. There is, therefore, John chapter, of uh, John, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 under verse 4. There is, therefore, now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Don't look at me. Look at the verse. And for sin condemned sin in the flesh. that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The Word made flesh, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. The Godhead, which is spirit, soul, and body. Okay? You and I have a spirit, soul, and body. The body of God the Father, the Word made flesh, our Lord Jesus Christ, started out as a little baby and grew. He might have had a scar or two as being a carpenter. And then, like I said, you read Isaiah chapter 52 and Isaiah chapter 53. And read what they did to him. How his visage, his visage was so marred. Now, he never sinned because God cannot sin. Okay? God cannot sin. That's impossible. God can't sin. But while God was manifest in the flesh... He was subject unto the same like things that you and I are. But yet he never sinned. Okay? You deal with verse 3 in Romans chapter 8, Catholic. You deal with the scripture, which we're going to look at. You can't. But we, we already looked in the scripture. Why? Because you're not saved. You're not of the church of the living God. You're an unregenerate man. All you Jesuits and you coadjutors. You're, you're not saved. You're a bunch of devils serving your father, the Pope. Serving your true father, Satan. You deal with the scripture. God sending him, verse 3, and look, look at it. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, condemns sin in the flesh. Why is the flesh so important to you? Oh, because your religion, your masters are all about the flesh. Peoples. Whom the horse sits upon, you know, the waters are peoples. Yeah. Yeah. Here's another thing, okay? Now, John chapter 6, which is the big go-to to the Catholic for their pucarist. Okay? For their Pucharist. Yeah. This is their big go-to for them. This is the... This is the... Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. And he's talking symbolic, by the way. I'll prove it to you. Okay? Okay? 
we will begin at verse 59 on to verse, oh, let's finish the chapter, okay? Verse 59 on to the close of the chapter of John chapter 6. Let's go. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard that, heard, when they had heard this, said, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, <laughs> Doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? You're looking at verse 63, right? And compare that with uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 3. And also about how, you know, the blood is the life of the flesh. It's the blood. You ready? Let's read this. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Now you, you put that verse 63 in, in context about what he's saying, that you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood, right? And yet he says, the flesh profiteth nothing, proving that he's talking symbolically about this, about being in him. Okay, that's, it's, it's symbolic. But see, the Catholic, the coadjutor, the Jesuit coadjutor, let's, let's clarify that, at the very least. They're harping on this, making this to be literal. Because their religion, Catholicism, is a vain religion of flesh. That's it. And our Lord, and okay, let's let's go with your argument, Catholic. Okay, if he's talking about this literally, that in his flesh is is meat indeed, that you're supposed to literally eat his flesh with your satanic, stupid, uh, hocus pocus, woody woody, uh, transubstantiation. Okay, okay, let okay, then wouldn't that mean this would be a contradiction if he said? His own, in that context, is he not saying that his own flesh would profit nothing? Huh? Think about that, you Catholics. This is your big to do, right? For your Pucharist. Because according to you Catholics, according to all your doctrines and this and all the catechisms, oh, yes, and even to these guys, oh, and, and of the uh, extreme oath, yes, yes, okay? If he's talking literally that you are to literally eat his flesh, then he says that right here in verse 63 of what he was just talking about. The flesh... Profiteth nothing. What do you do with that? Oh, and I, I've, I've seen your commentaries. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, oh we're going to get to that. You, you, you're going to love this when we get to this. You, you're going to really love this. Uh, again, brethren, get this book. Go ahead. Please. You can get it off of Amazon still. This was uh, something. Uh, this is something that. The Lord said, yeah, bro, I get it, okay? Okay? But uh, get it, brethren. Get it. I'm going to see something there. But there again, okay? Verse 63, what do you do with that? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let's continue. 
But there are some of you that believe not. And that's where the Catholic goes to. You know, there's a famine in the land. Amos chapter 8. Of hearing of the words of God. That prophecy will reach its fulfillment during the time of Jacob's trouble. But I'm getting ahead of myself. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, unto, and he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. That's not Calvinism. Okay? That's not Calvinism. Not at all. No. You come to the Lord on his terms, not your own. In brokenness and contrition. Okay? From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Shimon Peter answered him, and right here, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. The words of eternal life. The words of eternal life. Verse 63. Verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And verse 68, Then Shimon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. <laughs> Jesus answered them, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Shimon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 40 really quick. Okay, Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Verses 5 on to verse 7. No, verses 5 on to verse 8 in Isaiah chapter 40. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The voice said, Cry. And he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the, fo the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth. But the word of our God shall stand forever. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words are spirit and life. The words. The authorized version of the scriptures. But you hate. And, okay, we were going to look at Mark 14, verse 38. Write that down. And 1 Peter 1, verses 24 and verse 25. You write that down, okay? But instead what we're going to do, we have to go to 1 Corinthians. We have to, Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 37 on to verse 50. Uh, let's begin at verse 35 on to verse 50. But some man will say, How are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Thou fool. That which thou sowest does not quicken, except it die. Excuse me. 
and that which thou sowest, thou shouldest not that shouldest, and thou, and that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may change chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. But there is one flesh, one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, S-U-N, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written. <laughs> the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, our Lord Jesus Christ, was made a... Don't look at, no, no, look at the verse. Made a what? A quickening spirit. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Is not our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, uh, known as the Word with a capital W seven times within the scriptures? See, you have the church of the living God. You get this. You devils, you don't get it. And you're just sitting there seething with fury. Because your doctrine of the Pucharist is being debunked. Lord, have mercy on you devils. Let's continue. Howbeit that which that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now, I, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. And you got to remember, too, when our Lord appeared unto the disciples after his resurrection, you could see the imprints of his hands and of his feet and his side. But he could disappear just like that. He ate. Okay? Yes, he did. You know, remember, too, that they beheld his hands and stuff. Doubting Thomas, okay? So like, put, uh, put, reach your hand hither, okay? Why? Because the Jews required a sign. Okay? Then he ascended up into heaven. Okay? The body that he had, okay, that our Lord Jesus Christ had when he was walking around here after his resurrection, okay, could go through walls. Could come and go, disappear. He could uh, make his maybe his appearance look different onto those when he walked on the uh, Emmaus Road. Okay. 
But there again, what washes away our sin? It's the blood. But see, when you got some Jesuit coadjutor, some devil, harping on the flesh, what is that? That's Catholic. And why is that? Why is that? Well, I'm going to read to you a portion, just a portion, of one of the many anathemas from the Canons and Decrees of the Council of Trent. Okay? This will be located on page 79 and finished on page 80. Okay? So, here's what I'm going to be reading you. This page. Okay? If that comes in clear, I hope it does. Pause it and read it. This page. And also, this page. Okay? If you can read that. Pause it and read it. Canons of the Most Holy Sacrament of the Eucharist. The little perfectly round sun-shaped cookie. Canon 1. If anyone denies that in the sacrament of the Most Holy Eucharist are contained truly, really, and substantially the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and consequently the whole Christ, but says that he is in it only as in a sign or figure or force, let him be anathema. Guess what? I'm anathema. Because it was a sign, a figure. And see, when you got somebody out there to, uh, talking, you know, defending about the flesh of Jesus, only, and harping on that. Why is that? Because to that individual, the flesh is what? The body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's just the flesh, not the spirit. Because they are of the world. They have not the spirit of Christ. Canon number two. If anyone says that in the sacred and holy sacrament of the Eucharist, the substance of the bread and wine remains conjointly with the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, and denies that wonderful and singular change of the whole substance of the bread into the body and the whole substance of the wine into the blood, the appearances only of bread and wine remaining... Only an idiot would believe that. I'm sorry. Only an idiot would believe something like that. Oh. Which changed the Catholic Church, which changed the Catholic Church most aptly calls transubstantiation. Let him be anathema. Guess what? I'm anathema by the Catholic Church, of course. <laughs> I don't have my garbage can. Beg your pardon. Canon 3. If anyone denies that in the venerable sacrament of the Eucharist, the whole Christ is contained under each form and under every part of each form, when separated, let him be anathema. Like only like saying, you know, oh, it's the flesh, it's the flesh. <laughs> you wicked Jesuit pot scum, you. Canon 4. Uh, defend your Catholic doctrine there, Jesuit. Go right ahead. Defend it. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Canon 4. If anyone says that after the consecration is completed, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ are not in the admirable sacrament of the Eucharist, but are there only in Yusu, U-S-U, while being taken and not before or after, and that in the hosts or consecrated particles which are reserved 
or which remain after communion. The true body of the Lord does not remain. Let him be anathema. Canon 5. Anathema, cursed. The Catholic Church does that quite a bit. Jesuits. Jesuit Catholicism, one and the same. Canon 5. If anyone says that the principal fruit of the Most Holy Eucharist is the remission of sins, if anyone says that the principal fruit of the Most Holy Eucharist is the remission of sins, or that other effects do not result from it, let him be anathema. So, the Eucharist, which becomes the whole shebang in Jesus Christ, Notice how they mention the flesh first. The flesh first, right? Yeah. First is the earthly, then the heavenly. <laughs> yeah. That which is of men. Yeah. Yeah, you notice that? The Eucharist is salvation to the Catholic. The Eucharist is your salvation. The flesh is your salvation. Catholic, Jesuit, <laughs> yeah, 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 Canon 6. If anyone says that in the Holy Sacrament of the Eucharist, Christ, the only begotten Son of God, is not to be adored with the worship of Latira, L-A-T-R-I-A, also outwardly manifested, and is consequently neither to be venerated with a special festive solemnity, nor to be solemnly borne about in procession according to the laudable, laudable and universal rite of custom of Holy Church, the monstrance, the sun thing that they carry around and they put the pucarist in the middle of it, it's referring on to the monstrance, the sun, the bale, the symbol of Baal, people. Okay? Or is not to be set publicly before the people to be adored, and that the adorers thereof are, are, are idolaters, Catholics, calling the uh, Catholics idolaters. Yeah, you're idolaters, Catholics. Oh, guess what? Guess what they say of, of those of us who believe the truth, the authorized version of the scriptures. Guess what they say? Let him be anathema. Canon number seven. If anyone says that it is not lawful that the Holy Eucharist be reserved in a sacred place, <laughs> but immediately after consecration must necessarily be distributed among those present, or that it is not lawful that it be carried with honor to the sick. Let him be anathema. Canon 8. If anyone says that Christ received in the Eucharist is received spiritually only and not also sacramentally and really, let him be anathema. Verse, uh, verse excuse me. Canon 8. Let him be anathema if it's not really Jesus Christ, the cookie. You'll run into a Catholics like they don't believe, we don't believe that. Uh, not according to your own doctrines. Okay? Not according to the plethora of catechisms. Vatican Council too. Okay? And even the Jesuits' writings themselves. Okay? No, dear Catholic, no, your church, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, teach that that stupid little cookie is actually really Jesus Christ. Who is really blaspheming the Lord? Yeah. Yeah. Canon 9. If anyone denies that each and all of Christ's faithful 
are both sexes of both sexes are bound when they have reached the years of discretion to communicate every year at least at Easter in accordance with the prof precept of Holy Mother Church let him be anathema so here in this one they say at Easter a start day Easter Lenten eggs okay the egg symbol of I'm, I'm not going to get into it because it's grotesque okay but Easter Astarte, oh, really big for them. Let them be anathema. Let him be anathema, excuse me. Canon 10. If anyone says that it is not lawful for the priest celebrating to communicate himself, let him be anathema. In Canon 11, the last one. If anyone says that faith alone is a sufficient preparation for receiving the sacrament of the Most Holy Eucharist, let him be anathema. And lest so great a sacrament be received unworthily and hence unto death and condemnation, this Holy Council ordains and declares that sacramental confession, when a confessor can be had, must necessarily be made beforehand by those who cons whose conscience is burdened with mortal sin. Meaning, you got to be a Catholic. However, contrite they may consider themselves. Moreover, if anyone shall presume to teach, preach, or obstinately assert, or in public disputation, defend the contrary, he shall be ip, ip, ipso, e, ipso, excommunicated. Eo, ipso, communicate, excommunicated. Kicked out. Let him be anathema. Let him be anathema. Yeah. Yeah. See how serious the Catholic takes the flesh? The flesh. Now, let's look at something in this lovely, lovely little book. Uh, like I said, I, I highly recommend that you get this. Okay? Now, we are go I'm going to be reading uh, pages um, 42 and 43 to start here, okay? Then we're going to read an entire chapter here, uh, which is just going to blow your mind um, about these Catholics, okay? It's just kind of... <laughs> these are the Jesuits. This is the Council of Chari, where a guy basically hid in the closet and wrote down, overhearing all these Jesuits planning the world domination for the volition of a single man, the son of perdition, okay? This is what this is about, okay? This is referenced in that um, um, documentary, okay? But I, I was to get this, okay? But right here, this is what I'm going to be reading you, okay? Can you see that? Can you see that? Okay, where my finger is here, up to there. Pause that and read it if you can. Okay? From right to the... Okay. For I would not have it lost sight of that our chief concern must be to mold the people to our purpose, to our purposes. Kind of like what they're doing out there right now with all this coronavirus nonsense, right? Doubtless, the first generation will not be wholly ours. But the second will nearly belong to us. And the third entirely. Get a load of that. Yes. The people are the vast domain we have to conquer. And when we are free to cultivate it after our own way, we will make it fructify to the profit of the impervished granary of the holy city. We shall know how, by marvelous stories and gorgeous shows, to exercise heresy from the heads 
and hearts of the multitude. We shall know how to nail their thoughts upon ours. And then it says something in Latin, which I'm not even going to attempt to read to you. So that they shall make no stir without our good pleasures. Then the Bible, that serpent, which with head erect and eyes flashing fire, threatens us with its venom whilst it trails along the ground, shall be changed again into a rod as soon as we are able to seize it. And that wound, and what wounds will we not inflict with it upon these hardened pharaohs and their cunning magicians? What miracles will we not work by its means? Oh, then, mysterious rod, we will not again suffer thee to escape from our hands and fall to the earth. For you know but too well that for three centuries past, this cruel asp has left us no repose. You well know with what folds it entwines us and with what fangs it gnaws us. He's referring to the authorized version of the scriptures. And guess what? They don't have their hands on the authorized version of the scriptures. They don't. But what they have done is tried to copy it and replace it with many perversions. You know, the Westcott and Hort, which came out with the Revised Standard Version. The New Revised Standard Version. The New American Standard or the American Standard. Okay? The ESV, the NIV. The NET, those all stem from the Vatican, from the manuscripts that pertain to Alexandria, Egypt, while the text of the authorized version of the scriptures comes from Antioch. Yeah, yeah, they try to drown out the scriptures. And on that note, get your scriptures and turn to Amos chapter 8. We've got to look at this. We've got to look at this, okay? Amos chapter 8. Not Jonah, come on, Brad. Amos chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. Now, again, this prophecy will be fulfilled to its entirety in the time of Jacob's trouble. God's word is still going to be available, yes. But remember, when someone takes the mark of the beast during the time of Jacob's trouble, their mind is going to be alienated from God. Okay? Plus, it says within the scriptures that they're going to hell no ifs, ands, or buts. And see, again, all this stuff that the Jesuit-controlled media is pumping you people is getting you ready for this. But Amos chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. And with all the modern Bible perversions, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. Who sends the famine? Yeah! <laughs> Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. They have God said yeah, and they, they uh, these Jesuit trained cemeterians, you have to go to the Greek, you got to go to the Hebrew. God sends this famine. Why? Because people don't want the truth. They want to have their ears itched. Look in, uh, what is it, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 
read that and study it. Okay? <laughs> Got to be careful what you ask for of the Lord. He'll give it to you. But now, now, and I, I shared this with my wife. <laughs> we are going to read now a couple, cha uh, one chapter here, and then we're going to be done. Then we're going to be done. Um, this is on page 144, 145, 146, 147, and finishes on page 148. Okay? So, here. Okay. Let's see. Let me see. Okay. Can you see that? Okay. All right. Pause that and read it if you can. Okay. Pause that and read it. And right here. Right here. Pause that and read it to where the V is or VI is, okay? I have written here, wow. Okay, prepare yourself for this. This is a Jesuit speaking. My brethren, as to the Bible, be advised by me, for our greater good let us avoid, let us carefully avoid this ground, if I may tell you openly what I think of this book. It is not at all for us. It is against us. <laughs> I do not at all wonder at the invincible obstinacy it engenders in all those who regard its verses as inspired. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You are aware that when once entered upon theological studies, we must of necessity make some acquaintance with the Bible. Some acquaintance. Yeah. Yeah, but see, they're, these guys are not regenerated. They're natural men. They do not get the spiritual things from the Word of God because they're lost devils. That's why they have their commentaries and commentaries. I mean, uh, there's um, St. Mary's Catholic Church here in Woodstock, Illinois. They have a YouTube channel. And I commented on one of the videos by one of their Jesuit priest guys or whatever who was talking about Revelation. And he, he answered the question without answering the question. Jesuit sophistry, of course. But, yeah, they, they go through all these hoops and whatnot because they don't have the spirit. See. But they make some acquaintance with the Bible. Yes. Let's continue. For myself, although in company with numerous fellow students, mere machines accustomed to confound the text and the commentary as if they were one and the same thing, an illusion which, to confess the truth, is extremely useful to us. Get a load of that. It was yet impossible for me Endowed as I was with some capacity for reflection, as proved by my presence here, almost amongst the small number of the elect. <laughs> it was impossible for me, I repeat, to be so absurd, absurdly credulous as not to distinguish the text from the commentary but which its sense is almost always distorted. In the simplicity of youth, I fully expected on opening the New Testament, listen to this, to find there laid down totatum literis in letter capitali, 
the authority of a superior chief in the church. This is what he was hoping to find in the New Testament, this Jesuit, upon first reading it. Okay? The authority of a superior chief in the church and the worship of the virgin, the source of all grace for mankind, for, my, for mankind, I sought with the same eagerness for the mass, for purgatory, for relics, etc. This is coming from a Jesuit, you Catholic out there. This is coming from your own people that teach you. But in every page I found my expectations disappointed. For every reflection that I made resulted doubt. At last, after having read at least six times over that little book which set all my calculations at naught, I was forced to acknowledge to myself that it actually sets forth a system of religion altogether different from that, from that taught in the schools. And thus, all my ideas were thrown into confusion. You have a Catholic priest, a Jesuit, highly trained, who's acquainted with the Bible, the scriptures, openly confessing that what? There's no Pope. The authority of a superior chief in the church, there's no Pope. It's a lie. Okay? And the worship of the Virgin, Semiramis, the Roman Catholic Mary, the Queen of Heaven, it's not in there. It's not in the New Testament. They did it in the Old Testament, yes. 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 Not Mary, the Queen of Heaven, Semiramis. Okay? But it's not in there. Okay? <laughs> The source of all grace for mankind. I sought with the same ergen, uh, eagerness the mass for purgatory, for relics, etc. But in every page I found my expectations disappointed. Okay, never mind the coadjutor devils. If you're a Catholic and you've made it this far, the, the Jesuits, they're very, you know, they were introduced in 1541, 1540. This was in 1544, 1545, something like that. The Jesuits were extremely involved in the Council of Trent. The Jesuits were extremely involved in Vatican Council II, IHS, Isis Horus Set. Oh, no, they teach you Jesus Hamadan Salvatore, right? Jesus, the Savior of mankind, right? Or Jesus, man, savior, right? No, it's Isis horse set. This is coming from the lips of a Jesuit, of those who teach you Catholic. When are you going to wake up and realize that you are in Satan's church? Let me continue. The penetrating eye of my confessor perceived the agitation of my mind, and I was consequently obliged to disclose to him my distress and difficulty. Ah, Reverend Father, I said to him, I expected to find in the New Testament each of our different dogmas fully developed and dwelt upon in accordance with the value and importance which we are accustomed to attribute to them. What is my surprise to find they're nothing at all like what we deem the most essential in our doctrines. <laughs> I mean, that, I'm sorry for laughing, but I mean, come on. Catholic. Catholic, come on. 
Why do you think in the Council of Trent, uh, Council of Trent they put tradition over scripture? Why was that? Because they know that the scriptures don't back up what they teach. <laughs> uh, let, I'm gonna, let's continue. Without allowing me to proceed any further, he inquired, Have you communicated your thoughts to any of your fellow students? No, replied I. I have suffered much, but alone. That is well, he said. From that moment, he kept me apart from all the other students. And having repeatedly sounded my conscience to its very depths, he one day addressed this question to me, my child. I was at that time about 23 years of age. If I were to place in your hands the geography of Potlamy, or that of Strab Starbo, who lived about 2,000 years ago, and if I were to say to you, point out to me in these books the name of a single city of all those which have been since built, what would be your answer? I should say that it was impossible, since those cities do, did not then exist. Exactly so. And the case is absolutely the same with the New Testament. <laughs> the book of primitive Christianity. As with the geography of Potlamy or Starbo, all you seek there had its rise at a far later period. At these words of my superior, I looked upon him with stupefaction. He pressed me affectionately to his bosom and said, Do not distress yourself. You shall be a young man set apart. You are worthy to penetrate further than others. Jesus Christ himself, as you must have remarked, spoke to the multitude only in parables, but in private. He interpreted these parables to the apostles, saying to them, To you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom, that is to say, to possess the key of the secrets, of these secrets. But he carefully avoided using this language to the vulgar. That's talking about esoteric and esoteric. Speaking one way for the populace and another way to the elect, those in the know. The open but false policy, the hidden but true policy of the Jesuit. Esoteric and esoteric. One doctrine for the general populace and another for those of the society. That's what he's talking about. Double-tongued. Do you think a child in the cradle is equally advanced with a grown man? I rest my case. No. In like manner, this book is but the embryo of the church. Forms, new doctrines, the hierarchy, the power of the popedom, all these great things which have transformed the church into an ocean, as it were, have been the effect of gradual progress. Progressive Christianity? Ecumenicalism? Hello? A progress which has often indeed been impeded, often interrupted, but which we are destined to bring to its consummation. Afterward, in order to neutralize my impressions, he placed in my hands Dupus, Bollinger, B-O-U-L-A-N-G-E-R, Voloni, Voltaire, and some other writers. Very, very quickly, I have to mention this. Um, in Pete Ruckman's testimony, um, when he was talking to the Jesuit priest about things, he ran off and got him a bunch of books that, he needed, that the priest said to him that he needed to read instead of the scriptures. 
Okay, that just brought that to my mind. Just wanted to say that to you. By this means and by degrees, a new order of ideas was established in my mind, and I became in the end capable of rising to the loftiest views of our order. I have related this anecdote, which is entirely personal, merely to put you on your guard against too much confidence in reckoning, like the heretics, upon a book which unfortunately abounds in arms against us, not for us. Again. Again. <laughs> you have a Jesuit openly admitting, yes, the scriptures are against Catholicism. Yes. Why do you think they've infiltrated the cemetery schools? The yea hath God said, all the Bible perversions. God is not the author of confusion. They can't expound scripture. And at the best they can do is twist like what so many of them are doing right now. Consequently, let us lay down this principle in public to act as if we had nothing to fear from such a book. And they do. You do. You Jesuits. But rather as if it were favorable for us in private to describe it as dangerous and hurtful or where this would not be prudent to declare that it is the germ of which Catholicism is the complete and majestic development. A Catholic, young man, um, don't they tell you not to read too, too much scripture because it's dangerous, because you need the church fathers, you need the catechisms and Aquinas and yada, 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 all these other books to define to you the scripture because you don't have the Holy Ghost? <laughs> Amazing. Get, the, get, get this book. I highly recommend it to you. We shall thus provide ourselves with an arsenal a thousand times better stored than the biblical arsenal of Protestantism. We shall thus elude a crowd of difficulties and at the same time keep up the controversy between ourselves and the Protestants. The very thing we want the very thing they want. Yeah. Yeah. They want to create strife. They want to create division. They want to pester. They want to attack. Because their, their end is world domination by the volition of a single man, the son of perdition. For as long as the present state of things continues, as long as the mass perceive that our disputes lead to nothing decisive either way. They conclude that they conclude that if there had really been anything in the Bible which positively condemns us, it would, in the course of three centuries, have made itself fully apparent. <laughs> Get a load of that statement right there. Get a load of that. Their defensive strategies, their tactics, their use of dialect, of language. Meanwhile, let us be watchful to place our best workmen in the most important points. While these good automata aid us to lay stone upon stone under the direction of our initiated members. Could be referring to Masons, Freemasons. 
Our edifice will rise on foundations so solid as to withstand all shocks hereafter. As to our texts, let us select them from the old legends of the Bolandists. Should certain of our practices or doctrines be questioned, why then let us heap miracle on miracle? Let us repeat the old ones and make new, so as to throw a glittering veil over the Pope, the Virgin, Purgatory, Mass, our ecclesiastical vestments, our medals, our chaplets. Let our miracles be like an in inexhaustible watercourse, keeping up a perpetual motion in each wheel of our immense machine. Let the heretics and the philosophers cry out against us as they may. We will take no pains to silence them. We will make no reply. So they will tire themselves out. And in the end, they will let us alone. At the same time, I am quite of opinion that we ought by very possible means to secure the aid of modern thinkers. <laughs> Whatever be the nature of their opinions, if they can be inducted to write at all in our favor, let us pay them well, either in money or in laudation. For the love of money is the root of all evil, for, for by which some coveted after have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Provided that the universal edifice goes on constantly increasing, what matters it to us what workmen or what in implements are employed? Yeah, yeah. They will use certain workmen out there that are never going to go far, but they serve a purpose. Okay? They serve a certain purpose. There are some coagitors who are very good at agitating people. Aren't you? And that's all they're, they're good for. They're not going to get anywhere in the order. And once they've served their purpose... Poison cup, the leaden bullet, who knows? Hey, you, yeah, you. Hopefully you'll be venerated by your most holy Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> Saint Bob. <laughs> I can see him with that little stupid hat on. <laughs> I'm sorry, brother. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, these are some who have become very zealous Catholics because, as they say, we know how with our images, our paintings, our wax tappers, and our gold to produce a highly picturesque effect in our chapels. Others are converted because ours is the only church which possesses a pool, always ready, in which he who is soiled by sin may wash himself clean. Thus, you perceive that we are provided with an infinite number of baits to take all sorts of people, be it ours to become expert in the choice and in the use of them. Hold on one second. All right. Here's another book. I've shown you this before. Okay. This is a very uh, useful book also about the Jesuits. This has a copy of the Sacrita Monita, which this book mentions. Okay. The Sacrita Monita. Okay. The Secret Instructions of the Jesuits. Okay, this also has a portion of the um, uh, 50 years in the Church of Rome by Chinikboy. This also has the syllabus of errors in it, which one day I'm going to make a, a video on. <laughs> very, very weird. But I've read this to you before, but this is what I'm going to close with.
okay? From the Sakrita Monita, chapter 17, methods to exalt the company, the society of Jesus. Number one, and I have a, you can get a copy of the Sakrita Monita, the one that's in the British Museum with the Latin and the English off my channel, okay, as a PDF, all right? Just like you can with the, the oath, okay? Number one, treating principally all, though in things of little con consequence, we must have the same opinion or at least exterior dignity. For by this manner we may augment and strengthen the society more and more to overthrow the barrier we have overcome in the business of the world. Number two, thus strengthening all, it will shine by its wisdom and good example that we shall excel all the other fathers and particularly the pastors, etc., etc., until the people desire us to all, publicly divulging that the pastors do not need to possess such so much knowledge. With such they can discharge well their duties, stating that they can assist them with the councils of the society, that for this motive they can de de uh, dedicate themselves to all classes of studies. Three, we must inculcate this doctrine with kings and princes that the Catholic faith cannot subsist in the present state without politics. Yes. But that in this, it is necessary to proceed with much certainty of this mode. We must share the affection of the great and be admitted to the most secret councils. Four, we must entertain their goodwill by writing from all by writing from all parts interesting facts and notices. Five, it will be no little advantage that we will that will result by secretly secretly and prudently fomenting dissensions between the great ruining or argumenting, augmenting their power using the uh, Hegelian principle, okay? Controlling both sides of the argument to, um, to affect the outcome of that argument. What is it? Thesis, antithesis, subsesis, something like that? Can't remember offhand. But that's what the Hegelian principle is, which Weissop, you know, Hegel, that kind of stuff. Let's continue this. But if we perceive some appearance of reconciliation between them, then we of the society will treat and act as pacif pacif pacificators, that it shall not be that any others shall anticipate to obtain it. Six, as much to the magnates as to the people, we must persuade them by all possible means that the society has not been, but by a special divine providence, conforming to the prophecies of all the abbot Jacob, J-O-A-C-H-I-M, for to return and raise up the church, humbled by the heretics. Seven. Having acquired the favor of the great and of the bishops, it will be an entire necessity of empowering the curates and the press prebendaries to more exactly reform the clergy that in other times lived under certain rule with the bishops and tending to perfection. Also, it will be necessary to inspire the abbeys and prelocates Prelicacies, excuse me, the which it will not be difficult to obtain, calling attention to the indolence and stupidity of the monks as if they were cattle, because it will be very advantageous for the church if all the bishoprics were occupied by members of the society. And yet, 
as if it was the same apostolic chair, particularly if the Pope should return as temporal prince of all the proprietary, per, pro, properties, excuse me, properties, excuse me. For as much as it is very necessary to extend little by little, with much secrecy and skill, the temporalities of the societies, and not having any doubt that the world will enter the golden age to enjoy a perfect universal peace for following the divine benediction that will descend upon the church. All shall be thine. If thou bow down and worship me. Who said that? Satan. Luke chapter 4. Eight. But if we do not hope that we can obtain this, supposing that it is necessary that scandal shall come in the world, we must be careful to change our politics, conforming to the times, and excite the princes, friends of ours, to mutually make terrible wars that everywhere the mediation of the society will be implored, that we may be employed in the public reconciliation. Think about that, about what's going on outside right now with all this coronavirus junk. For it will be the cause of the common good, and we shall be recompensed by the principal ecclesiastical dignities and the better benefactaries. Nine, in fine, that the society afterwards can yet count upon the favor and authority of the princes, procuring that those who do not love us shall fear us. Well, brethren, there you go. We have to be aware of the Jesuit order, and we also have to be aware that the Jesuits themselves, the Catholic Church, by their own admission, admit that the authorized version of the Scriptures is against them. And that they seek world domination. And they're all about flesh. That's all that they are about, the flesh. Because in the, um, because in the decrees from the Council of Trent, uh, talking about the Pucharist, what was always mentioned first? The body, the body, the body, flesh. Be aware of this, brethren. Be aware of this. For this is what we have to deal with. And the hour is late. And people are descending farther into madness. And their ears, they are stopping. They don't want to hear the truth. And the Jesuit order, Catholicism, is there to oblige them. Because the end justifies the means. And it's all about the flesh to you. Nothing of the spirit. May our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, rebuke you devils. Thank you so much for watching this, if you do. And we'll see you in the next video.